Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by the UPS Store Canada. I'm <laughs> very, very, very excited about uh, this edition of the podcast. A uh, very special guest coming up. Before we get to our guest, and we don't want to keep them waiting, um, we uh, have to say a thank you to our good friends at the UPS Store. Uh, the UPS Store is our title sponsor. They have 380 locations across the country. And thanks to our old friend, David Drucker. He said, I think people would be interested in your podcast, and I think our stores should support it. And so he did. And I brought Ted to a UPS store just the other day. We went to the UPS store in Ile Perot, Quebec, and met Jason Liverman and his wife, Stacy Friend, who run that location. And uh, that was my first time in a UPS store. Yes. And uh, I'm going back because those yep. uh, packing peanuts are delicious. <laughs> Can't get enough of those. <laughs> They're a bit dry, mind you. Yeah, I think you were using them for the wrong thing, Ted. I think so. Uh, if you're looking for courier services, packaging services, parcel receiving, if you need a mailbox, printing, copying, they can do anything to help your small business. They have, like I said, a location close to you no matter where you're listening to this. Um, unless, of course, you're on a deserted island. Um, you can find the location nearest you at the upsstore.ca. Our very special guest today is a national treasure and doesn't really uh, do many uh, interviews because he's long been retired. But if you know the game of hockey, you know this name. Um, and it is the legendary Dick Irvin Jr. who has decided to uh, spend a little time with us today. Dick, I don't know how to say thanks, but thank you so much. Well, I'm the one that should be thanking. You know, I'm, I'm totally not forgotten. <laughs> no, God, <laughs> no, you're I, not. You not, know. That it, not that it bothers me, but hey, when you get a chance to sit down and chat with a couple of old buddies, what, yeah. what, what's better than that, that? That's very nice. My, I told my dad this morning that I was having you as a guest today, and I think he was more excited than I was. He said, please <laughs> tell Mr. Irvin I said hello. So okay. uh, greetings okay. from my father, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dick, I guess I'll, I'll start with... Um, I can see just over your shoulder, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a Canadian's logo back there and a couple of nice pieces of memorabilia. I imagine one of many in the house. Um, what, do, what do you do to keep busy these days? Well, what does a 91-year-old guy do to keep busy? That's a good question. But uh, I poke around and uh, have health problems and get COVID. And, uh, you know, and I have a wonderful family living next door, my daughter, her husband, and two 21-year-old twin boys. So if I need a light bulb change, I call them and they come in and do it for me. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I'm probably not as active as I should be. I quit golfing. I played till I was 87. Wow. And uh, then uh, it, what, why I quit, it wasn't that I couldn't physically hit the golf ball yet anymore. I was lousy. I couldn't play. <laughs> I used to be not a bad golfer. I had a four <laughs> handicap at one time. Uh, my ego wouldn't take it. Yeah, <laughs> that was I, so bad. I, so I said, "The heck with this." I'm still a member of the Beaconsfield Golf Club. I've been a member there for 70 years. Wow. And uh, you know, I'm cut, getting caught up in some reading, and uh, I'm a bit of a news junkie when it comes to television uh, and old movies. Wow. And uh, nice. what can I say? It's, it's very difficult. Why do you have to ask me what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta, and, hey. Uh, you know so, uh, who was a. Uh, no, I, I, I try to keep up. That's you know right. who was a hell of a golfer well into his 80s was Elmer Locke. I had oh, the, yeah. I had the pl privilege of playing with him one day at a charity tournament, and uh, he got aggravated with my bad swing and came over to coach me. <laughs> he was <laughs> he hit the ball straight every time, that guy. Yeah, Elmer was a member of Summerlee for many, many years. Yeah. And, uh, I played quite a few games of golf with him, and uh, he was quite a guy. Quite a guy. Dick, you sound exactly the same, and we had this discussion just before we started the actual recording of the podcast. Uh, we were talking about doing crossword puzzles, and I have found, I'm a generation behind you, and I have found that staying mentally active and doing things like crossword puzzles uh, and, and keeping my brain busy and working uh, is also a very important uh, part of staying of staying healthy because mental health, as we learn more and more as time goes on, is just as important as physical health. Well, I do one crossword a day, Ted, and uh, like you say, it's a good. It's good. I think it's good for me. Yeah, 
and uh, sometimes I do too. But basically, I'm a one crossword guy, and uh, so yeah, I enjoy them. And I didn't start doing them until very late in life. I wasn't doing them when I was working at uh, on television or anything like that. But I've started the last few years. One thing I have done, though, or did do for a period of about nine or ten years after I finally retired, although I still haven't retired. CBC can call me tomorrow to go on the show uh, if they want. But uh, I did a lot of traveling. Uh, for a period of nine or ten years, I took um, by, by land, by sea, by air, uh, mainly by sea. I took 20 cruises, uh, 16 of them on a ship called the Queen Mary II, my home away from home. And uh, I saw parts of the world that I never dreamed I'd see, uh, you know, and uh, that was uh, a big part of my life for quite a while, and I had a wonderful time. What sticks out for you? What were some of your favorite destinations, and what were some really interesting discoveries for you? I took a 42-day cruise one time on the wow. Queen Mary, got out in Hong Kong, and got off in New York 42 days later. And uh, among the places that uh, I went to on that particular trip was the Suez Canal. And we sailed down the Suez Canal, and I want to tell you, I, I, I'm not that big a history buff, but when you think about what happened over the years at the Suez Canal, you know? I mean, there were people on the ship sitting there playing cards, sleeping, reading a book, couldn't care less. I was thrilled. To, to be, it's not that big a deal. The Wascana Lake in Regina is wider than <laughs> the Suez Canal, uh, it's where I grew up. But uh, you know, it's, it's things like that. I, I, uh, I, I, the only part of the world that I didn't touch, and not that I stayed, was the say around Australia, New Zealand. Never got there in that part. The South, what do they call it, South Pacific. Yeah, I guess they yeah. Call it. Um... But the rest of it, I, I, I touched on so many places: Egypt, India. You know, the Mediterranean took two trips into the fjords in Norway, which was just uh, just mind boggling to see those, uh, especially at night. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, I, and I did a lot of flying. I went to London with a group. They used to call themselves the Canadian Senior Tour. They've changed the name now. I forget what it is. Um, we took show. I took show tours to the London West End. And uh, saw some great shows. And, uh, you know, the fellow that plays, uh, David Suchet, plays Poirot on uh, television uh, he was uh, i saw him on a play in uh, london one time and uh, so uh, that was a big part of my life for quite a while and uh, enjoyed every minute of it so uh, I've, I've been busy i've been busy dick being on a on a, a ship for 42 days i'm just <laughs> gonna say that yeah you were gonna ask the same thing <laughs> that's I, a long time to be at sea yeah, boy uh, but i, <laughs> I want to tell you it, it was the last i don't know half not quite half of their world tour that they take every year they leave southampton around Christmas or New Year's, and they get back to New York in April. So they're gone wow. for about 100 days. Yeah, I wish I'd have taken the 100 really? days. Really? Wow. I'm, I'm well, curious. Well I, well, I have to admit that when I started out on the 42-day job, <laughs> I'm saying to myself, have I bitten off more than I can chew here? You know? <laughs> but when it was over, I wished it had kept going. Wow. Uh, it, it, you know? I'm so, uh, yeah, it was uh, just something that uh, hit my hot button, and I... I enjoyed it. Curious about being on a ship, Dick. You you cross paths with a you know a lot of the same people every day, and I was wondering, does everybody you run into want to talk about hockey? No, nobody talked about hockey because oh. nobody knew who I was. Oh wow! You know? Okay, wow. You know, no, there there were very few Canadians. There were there was the odd guy, but yeah. nothing. Uh, no. No, yeah. but uh, that was and and you don't get much news. Uh, yeah, uh, although uh, somebody set a record, broke one of my dad's records. They give you news every night, and it's lying on your bed when you come in, and there's the news of the day, and, and they print it out. And one time, my dad's name was in it. Somebody wow. had broken one of his records, uh, coaching, uh, uh, coaching in the NHL. You know, so uh, and uh, and oh yeah, one uh, Nancy reminds me. One time, I was on the last day of a trip. I was having breakfast at the Queen, on the Queen Mary. It might have been the first one. Who comes up to me in the dining room but John LeClaire. He's played for the Canadian. Oh, oh my yeah, God, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. Vermont the guy that scored the yeah. two straight overtime goals yeah. on the road in the L.A. series. The 93. Only other Montreal Canadian player that's ever done that was Rocket Richard. And uh, there was John. And he had been on the ship the whole time, but I'd never seen him. <laughs> oh, no kidding. And I said, John. And he said, well, I saw you once, but you were talking to some people, and I didn't want... And I said, God, you know, so uh, that was kind of funny that a member of the Montreal Canadiens was on the same ship as I was a former member. Dick, if you were at sea for 42 days and you could have done the whole 100, they must have some pretty nice amenities aboard the Queen Mary. Different show every night in the showroom. It's just, I don't know, there was just something about the atmosphere. You know, one trip I took a couple of times... 
You go over, you leave New York, you go to Southampton, you spend half a day in Southampton. I go to the nicest shopping center, looking for you, Ted, all the time. Of course. The best <laughs> shopping center I was ever in in my life was is in Southampton, right near where the ship docks. Get back on the ship and go back to New York. And it's like a 14-day holiday going to a cottage or something, yeah. except you're sitting on a ship and looking at nothing but water. And, I, and for some reason, I could do that tomorrow again. Funny, eh? Dick, did you have a... Uh... I guess I, I could call it, or maybe you would describe it differently, but did you have a friendship or a special relationship with the Rocket because your dad was coaching and there were stories of you being able to sit on the bench at breakfast and whatnot? No, I wouldn't say it was special. Rocket was a, I don't know of anybody that, uh, give or take a uh, couple, who had uh, what you'd call a special relationship, certainly not me. He was finished playing. When I started broadcasting, okay, he hmm. started even in the broadcasting business, never mind doing the hockey games. Um, when my dad was coaching him, we didn't live in Montreal uh, during the time, much of the time that the Rocket played. Um, the first time I ever saw Morris Richard play, I was 10 years old. We were, my dad used to commute between Regina and in the summer and Montreal to coach the Canadians in the winter. Seasons then were 48 games. Wow. He'd leave Regina in October and he'd be back home the end of March. Huh. I mean, it was totally different than now. And they had this young player, one of a bunch of guys trying out, and uh, they were playing the Boston Bruins. I was with my mother at the game at the Forum. I mean, my dad used to live in the Mount Royal Hotel. That's where we stayed. And the Rocket got body checked by a Boston Bruin defenseman named Johnny Crawford. And uh, Johnny Crawford was the only player in the NHL. This is in 1943, 42, maybe. Uh, Crawford was the only player in the NHL who wore a helmet, and he didn't do it for protection. He did it because he was bald, and he was embarrassed by <laughs> oh, being bald. Oh, wow. So he wore a helmet so nobody could see his bald head. But anyway, he hit the rocket, and the team doctor was sitting beside my mother, and he we were down low, and he said, that man has a broken leg. And he went right over on the ice, and sure enough, this young unknown, untried player, had a broken leg, and he didn't play again that year. Wow. He was finished. And he came back to the camp the next year, and my dad wanted him, Tommy Gorman. He had broken his wrist playing junior hockey, broken his ankle playing senior hockey, one year after the other, and now he breaks his leg in the NHL. The guy's brittle. He's never going to make it. He gets hurt every time he turns around. And Tommy Gorman, the general manager, had a deal going with the New York Rangers. And he came that close to trading Morris Richard to the Rangers. Wow. My dad, my dad wanted him on the team. He liked him. He liked his attitude. He liked the way, he, you know, and so he, they had an argument and my dad won. And wow. He stayed on the team. That's how close. Hey, Sam Pollock was uh, called in Scotty Bowman and Claude Duell one time after Guy Lafleur's third year when he scored 21 goals. Not much of a production for a number one draft choice three years into the league, and you only score 21 goals on the best team in hockey. And Sam said, maybe I'm going to trade him while I can get something for him. You know, the old wow. general manager team. And Scotty and Claude talked him out of it. That's and, uh, the, can, you, can, can you imagine? No. Those two, uh, uh, Scotty told me that story. So well, anyway, I, I, back to the rocket. Yeah. And, uh, so he, but during the practice, the, the training camp, which was they were holding at the forum, he asked my father, probably through an interpreter, I don't know if he could speak English, <laughs> um, if he could get the morning off the next day because uh, his wife was going to have a baby. So my dad said, sure. So he didn't show up the next morning. And the, the, Mrs. Richard had the baby. And he came back and he had worn number 15 the first year that he played, uh, the, the broken leg year. So uh, my dad said to him, uh, how much did the baby weigh? Rocket said nine pounds. My dad said, why don't you take number nine? Holy so that's a memory wow. of the baby. And Rocket didn't know nine from 15. What did it mean to him? So, okay. So that's how he got number nine. Is that how number nine <laughs> became? I remember when I was a kid playing minor hockey, if you got number nine, that that always went to the best player on the team. Did that start yeah. with Rocket? Because Gordy Howe well, wore number nine, Gordie Bobby Hall wore number nine. Yep. One, one of the best uh, stories that, that, that I've heard lately in the years that when the guys are getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, Nicholas Lidstrom, the great defenseman for Detroit, the night that he got inducted, he told the story of how he arrived from Sweden to the, his first Detroit Red Wing training camp. And the trainer asked him what number he wanted on his sweater when he was working out, trying out for the team. 
he said, well, maybe I'd like to try and number, have number nine. <laughs> and, 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 and as Lind, as Lindstrom says, I learned a very big lesson in North American <laughs> hockey history. <laughs> yeah. Right then and there. The trainer must have laughed out loud at him. <laughs> yeah. I, that, I can't. It's funny, you know, how close things came to changing the idea that Maurice Richard would have played in anything but a Bleu Blanc Rouge sweater is yeah. is just almost impossible to imagine, Dick. Yeah. And wow. that year he scored, that he made the team and he scored 32 goals, I think it was. Or no, maybe not. Yeah, 32, I think. And they won the Stanley Cup. And the next year was the 44-45 the, the, the season was the 50 and 50. Wow. And today, as we talk, today it was is the anniversary of the night uh, when in 1957, when he scored his 500th goal, wow. <clears throat> and he dedicated that goal to my father, who had passed away in May uh, of that year, and uh, they struck a trophy. They had a dinner in the town of Mount Royal. Danny Gallivan was the MC, and the Rocket presented my mother with uh, this trophy commemorating his 500th goal and dedicated to Dick Irvin Senior. So that's, uh, that's, wow. that's good. You talk about having souvenirs and whatever. That's wow. that's a big, yeah. Dick, you mentioned Guy Lafleur and how he struggled in his first three years. You were covering the team then, and you saw him break through in his fourth season. What was the difference, do you think? What happened that he was able to have that breakthrough? That, you know, that that's one of the... I broadcast his first goal uh, in Los Angeles. I was doing the game on radio. And uh, he'd been off. He had a lot of pressure on him, just like there is on this kid Bedard today. Yeah. Too much, too much. But anyway, the people expected the flower to get three goals his first game sort of thing. You know, It wasn't that long into the season. I think it was still in October. But they were, they were playing a Saturday night game in L.A., and he scored on a goaltender named Gary Edwards, who I got to be good friends with. He did some color work for me in later years when he stayed in L.A. He's from Toronto. Gary Edwards used to say his main claims to fame in the National Hockey League was he gave up Guy Lafleur's first goal and Bobby Orr's last. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, so, uh, and, you know, the first couple of years, they won the cup in Guy's second year, the 1973 Cup, Scotty's first cup here. And he was not a factor. He, he was not a factor in the cup win at all. And then the next year, he wasn't even less of a factor, 21 goals. And uh, so the story goes that Ivan Cornway, first of all, told him, get rid of the helmet. He had a goofy-looking helmet. Yeah, I remember it. And uh, remember that? And uh, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't, you know, I, I mean, I was covering the team, but they played the New York Islanders the first game uh, of the season. And you took a look down from the broadcast booth and you said, who's wearing number 10? Who is this guy? Where'd he come from? <laughs> wow. And it just, it was like that. Unbelievable. He scored 53 goals <laughs> after scoring 21 Something must have happened that fueled. Something yeah, must have happened that fueled I, his yeah. confidence. Yeah, because it sounds I, like I a just, confidence I, issue. I can't. I never sat down with him and said to him, you know, what happened to you. And I don't think he would have maybe had a decent answer anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know that my dad coached the Rocket for the first thirteen years of his career, and he used to say that when Morris Richard scored a goal, he couldn't tell you after he scored it how he scored it. Well, Lafleur was the same. Hmm. Everything with those two guys was done instinct. Everything was instinct. Larry Robinson told me the story. I was writing a book on the Canadians one time, and he talked about the power play wasn't working. So Scotty devoted a couple of practices to setting up a system for the power play, a new system, whatever they were going to do. And he gave up because Lafleur couldn't do it. Hmm. It was programmed. Lafleur couldn't do it. He, everything with him was just, it happened, and that's all. And I was on a couple of TV shows with Guy after he retired. And they would show a goal he scored. One I remember was the overtime goal against Boston one year in the finals. He scored on Jerry Cheevers. And the host of the show said, well, now let's explain. And, and I'm sitting there as it was sort of in the audience, uh, wincing, because he didn't have a clue <laughs> how he scored it. I remember the goal very well. But uh, I'm not saying I'm not smart. But, you know, Guy just didn't, that, it meant nothing to him. It's funny, eh? Yeah. I, I don't know if Bobby Hull could describe his goals. I don't know if Gretz could describe his goals. I don't know. But uh, he was, and that's how they played the game. Dick and that's was, why they were so great. Dick, how would you describe your father as a coach? Was he a was he a tough coach? Was he a, a coach yeah. of his area? Was a tough guy? Tough I think to play? So. Yeah. I think so. 
Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to show you here picture where this is going to go. Yeah, I'll see. That's what I was looking for. Oh, oh look wow. That. Look at that. Now that's my dad when he coached the Toronto Maple Leafs. So this was, uh, what am I there? Three years old, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Four? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And so that's when he started, co well, he started in Chicago. Wow. But that's, uh, that's a something. picture. And uh, yeah, he had the reputation of, uh, he's the only guy in the history of the NHL. And it's not an official record, unfortunately, who, has, who coached 26 consecutive years. Wow. Scotty didn't even do that. When he left here, he became the general manager in Buffalo for a couple of years. Remember that? Yeah, he I was do. coaching. Yeah. Roger Nielsen was the coach at one time. <clears throat> and so Scotty didn't. That's one record for my dad. He didn't break because yeah. you know, <laughs> my dad had them all when he when he left coaching. Scotty came along. He broke them all. But of course, since then, there's been more wins and not wins, but uh, games and this and that for for coaching. But I think my dad was considered to be kind of a tough guy. Um, he used to have a saying, and I heard the uh, current coach of the Canadians sort of echo the same thought the other day. There are some players, as my dad used to say, you have to treat with vinegar, and some mm -hmm. you have to treat with sugar. Mm. Rocket Richard played his best hockey when he was mad. <laughs> you could be mad at the other team, mad at the referee, mad at the coach. Yep. If he was mad, he played well. Bernie Jeffreyon, you used to have to keep telling him how good he was, huh. or he'd sulk. <laughs> Toe Blake, Toe, Toe Blake who coached Boomer for several years after my after he took over. He told me one time Jeffrey Young drove him crazy. No kidding. Because of the you know his his attitude toward things because everything had to center around Boom. Right. Like a, uh, call him Donald Trump. I don't know. But Take uh, so that's that's how you. I think you have to understand your men. Yeah. And I think my dad was pretty good at that. You know, pretty good at that. And, uh, well, obviously he coached for 26 years. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that's the, uh, a key to, to coaching. And But I, he had the reputation of being tough. And I can remember when we moved to Montreal in uh, 1951, and he was still coaching. And if a, we'd, if a player was injured and wasn't playing and was home sick or hurt, my dad would phone him in the evening and talk to him. You know, how are you? How are you doing? What's, uh, you know, how are things sort of thing? So he was, he, he had to play it both ways. But uh, but I always remember that business about the vinegar and the sugar. Yeah, yeah, that's and, something. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Dick, take a sip of water and a break. We just, we've got another sponsor we got to thank. A good friend of ours, uh, Sugar Sammy, who's uh, currently on tour, is uh, sponsoring the podcast. Uh, Ted and I saw Sugar uh, Sammy's uh, Just Pour Rire de show just a couple of months ago and of course it's now legendary in quebec and he's taking it across the country and it's becoming legendary across the country yes. i'm quite impressed that he's selling out shows in winnipeg in edmonton in calgary in vancouver uh his his renown is spreading far and wide i know he's well known in france but yep. he went over there he lived there he worked french television he worked the french comedy circuit over there but I'm I'm quite surprised that he's selling out shows. I probably shouldn't be. Yeah, you shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm surprised that they know uh, that, that that his his reputation yeah. has preceded him in in Western Canada. I didn't know that his that his acclaim was that well entrenched in across the country. That's how good he is. All of 2023 has now been sold out. If you've been thinking about seeing him, he's just added dates in 2024. January is already sold out in 2024, and February is going fast. If you're lo listening to this uh, before Christmas 2023, it would make a nice Christmas gift, but you better act quickly. Go to SugarSammy.com. That's SugarSammy.com. Are and <laughs> Go ahead, Ted. I was just going to say, and thanks to Sammy for coming on board as a sponsor. That's yeah. quite flattering to us. Yes, it is. And um, we're working on having, a, 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 as a guest on the podcast, our very special guest today is uh, Dick Irvin. And uh, that's okay if we walk down memory lane a little bit. Eh? You don't mind talking about the older older days, do you, Dick? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, excellent. Um, do you have um, a, a... I know as a broadcaster, you're not supposed to take size... But do you have a really uh, memorable Stanley Cup that sticks in your mind that you replay in your head sometimes at night? 
You know, it's one of the first ones, not the first one, but one of the first ones, 1971, uh, the year the Canadians uh, upset Boston. I think Boston finished something like 24 points ahead of them. Uh, that's the year Phil Esposito scored 76 and 76. Oh, oh. We seem, well, we seem to have lost the feed. Oh, He's there we go. again running away with the regular league. And uh, so uh, now they play the, the Bruins in the first round. Uh, late in the season, they brought up a goaltender that Dred Fisher used to refer to as Ken Who. Uh, <laughs> he, played, he, he played six games in the regular season, and they opened the season in in uh, Boston, or the series in Boston, and uh, Al McNeil was the coach, and he started Ken uh, Who and Nets, and the Bruins won the game, I think it was 3-1. to one. And uh, the French press was all up in arms because Rogie Vachon was the backup and they wanted Rogie to play. And so when McNeil announced that Dryden would start the second game, uh, it was great to, to do about it. And halfway through the second game, when the Bruins were leading 5-1, there was more of a to do about it. <laughs> and right at the end of the second period, with about a minute to go, Henry Richard took the puck and he skated around the Boston defense. And it happened to be the guy he skated around happened to be wearing number four and he scored. So that made it five to two at the end of the second period. Hey, still no sweat for the Bruins five, two and home ice. And when the teams came out, these, this is a sort of a silly thing, but when the teams came out that we weren't on the air yet, we'd gone to commercial and the, and the cameras were following the players as they skated. In those days, the players used to be able to come out. They can't do it anymore. Skate around the ice for five, three or four minutes oh, before yeah. they started yeah. the period. Remember that? Yeah, I do. And the camera took a shot of Orr and Derek Sanderson. And they were having a real giggle between the two of them. They were laughing it up pretty good, whatever they were talking about. And Ralph Mellenby, the late Ralph Mellenby, who was the producer directing the show that time, said into my ear, he said, if I were these guys... I wouldn't be so happy yet. This game's not over. Wow. So anyway, the third period started, and Jean Beliveau took over like he was, it was vintage. It was vintage. And the Canadians won the game 7-5. Wow. <laughs> they scored five goals in the third period. I remember Jean setting up Frank Mahovlet on one of them. I think Jacques Lemaire and another, I'm not sure. And the Canadians, that was the big, the best comeback I ever saw the team make. Was that and the, they ended up winning the series. Was they, that, they won it in game seven uh, in Boston on a Sunday afternoon. And they won the, the seventh game. And then they went on. They beat Minnesota. It was a good series. And then they played Chicago. And that series went seven games. And the Blackhawks had Bobby Hull. And if my memory serves me right, uh, but Chicago was leading in the game 2 nothing. Game seven, home ice. And Montreal had a penalty, and Bobby Hull hit the post. I mean, Dryden was out of the net by a country mile. Hull shoots from the point, hits the post. Now, if that goes in, it's 3 nothing, and it's game over. The Canadians win the game 3-2. Henry scored two goals. And that's the goal. That's the, the goal that Jock Lemaire scored when he shot the puck from center ice almost. Yeah. And on a line change, goes to the bench, gets on the bench, looks up at the net, and the red light's on. <laughs> Tony Esposito lost the puck in the air. That made it two to one. Uh, yeah, two to one. And then Henry scored uh, one goal near the end of the second period. Uh, another. That's and he was the one that. That's when he had the big row with Al McNeil. Said McNeil was the worst coach he ever played for. <laughs> blah blah blah. Uh, anyway, Henry scores the winning goal, and they win the cup. And and that was John Bellamo's last game. Wow. And to, and there and the the image that I have, guys, of. One of my big, not the game itself, but it was Jean carrying the Stanley Cup off the ice at the Chicago Stadium. Too bad it wasn't at the Forum, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. It, and that was his last act. He retired. Uh, and you know, remember that when Bellamo retired? Yeah. Remember that? Ed? And then yeah. uh, the next day, they uh, it was the draft, and uh, they drafted Guy Lafleur. Yeah. So that that series, I know, I saw. I broadcast. I, I counted up the other day. I think I was in on the broadcast. Of six, uh, 19 Stanley Cup winning games. Wow. It's not always with the Canadians. And that's uh, pretty good. And uh, But that's one that the, every, when people ask me about it, I I, uh, I remember the, the, the two years that Pittsburgh won. 
Mario's year, 91 and 92. It wasn't so much dramatic, but Mario Lemieux in those two years raised the individual game of hockey to a level like I had never seen before hmm. and I've never seen again. I've never, I mean, I, I didn't see that much of Wayne because he was in the West and I was in the East. And so I didn't do any Edmonton playoff games. I did the first year they won the cup when they beat the Islanders, but I don't think I did any other finals when they won uh, the cup. Uh, and, uh, the Islanders, yes, I'd worked the Islanders before that. Remember, there was dynasties then, eh? Yeah. Montreal won yeah. four in a row. Islanders won four in a row, and then Edmonton won four out of five. Yeah. So in that period of time, uh, and the Canadians won the middle one in 1986, the, the, the surprise year. So in that period of time, which is quite a few, a dozen years or more, only three teams won the Stanley Cup. Well, that and that year, Dick, that that uh, they won the the Stanley Cup. You're talking about John Bellabo's last. That beef that Armie Richard had with Al McNeil was widely covered by the press. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the last time that the Canadians had a coach who couldn't speak French. Is that correct? That won the cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because that that was, that was quite a beef they had. Well, I, I, Henry, he wasn't he, Henry. I think I think, as I recall. Henry wasn't playing enough. He, yeah. uh, McNeil might have skipped him over a couple of shifts. I don't know. Yeah. I can't recall what that was now. Al McNeil is one of the sweetest guys you ever want to meet. And I think he's the only coach in NHL history who won a Stanley Cup and started the next year coaching in the minor leagues wow. because they hired Scotty. Wow. Scotty became available. Yeah. And Sam Pollock wanted him. So he signed Scotty. That the St. Louis Blues let Scotty go. And uh, the Canadians, uh, Al was still in the system. Yeah. And then then he left the Canadians organization to become, I guess, was it not the first, one of the first, the second coach of the Atlanta Flames. Oh. The Atlanta Flames. And uh, Bernie Jeffrey was the first coach that they had. But, uh, yeah, so that was what, it, it was pretty bitter. And, of course, I mean, Al McNeil, they, had a, they played a Sunday afternoon game in that Chicago series. And Al had a couple of detective surge policemen standing yeah. beside him on the bench yeah. because of the crowd, the, you know, the, 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 the public reaction to what Henry said and so on. It was big time, big time. <laughs> that night, <laughs> you know? that 1971 Stanley cup, I was a 12 year old boy and a Montreal Canadiens fan and yeah. everything Dick just described. I remember all of it vividly. That 7-5 yeah. game with Boston, I went to bed early. I got up the next morning, and my dad said, hey, guess what? <laughs> the bubble Stanley Cup run of a couple of years ago, Dick, reminded me of that year. Um, it just, it just the, the, the sort of the improbability of it and, and the, the excitement it generated around the team, it just it reminded me a little bit of that year. Mm, I don't yeah. know if I, I, you know, I don't know yeah. if I'm off base there, but it, but it did. That was in, intuitively, it made me think of 71. Dick, yeah, good point. Yeah. Dick, yeah. Uh, we yet had... what bothers me now as a fan, I've been a fan closet and otherwise of this team since I was eight years old. First time I walked, walked into their dressing room with my father, his first year here. Uh, boys, we've had two years in last place. Yeah. And yeah. I don't like yep. it. Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it must be uh, with, with the, uh, the amount of, of uh, time that you've spent, you know, not only calling games, uh, you know, uh, as a broadcaster for the Canadians, but you have a family history with the Canadians. It must be tough to watch, Dick. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 the last couple of years have been, I yeah. say. Yeah. I, we so, had... And I had, I, I, they, they played pretty good in Toronto last week, but that <laughs> game they played against Minnesota on Saturday night, that didn't give me much. It didn't <laughs> no. give me a lot of hope. No, we <laughs> I mean, have... it's, a, it's a long season. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, oh, and yet, you know, there's 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 this schedule business with all the games they have. The kid uh, Bedard played here last week. They don't come back. We don't see Chicago again at Montreal this year, wow. this season. Bobby Hull used to come to the forum seven times. Seven times oh. we'd see Bobby Hull. That's the most exciting player in hockey in his uh, heyday. Yeah. Yeah. Freddie Howe would come seven times. The last two years, my father coached the Canadians. They, the, the Montreal and Detroit were by far, I mean, way ahead of everybody else in the league. They were dominating teams. 
those two teams in those two years, 1954 and 1955 playoffs, uh, 55, yeah, played each other 21 times. Well, geez, <laughs> Louise. <laughs> and the season. Seven home, yeah. seven away, and they played in the playoffs, and both series went seven games. Wow. 21 the- times, the two best teams in hockey by far. Yeah. Played each other. Now, you know? And this, Gee, Montreal played Toronto. They played them what three times in the exhibition a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, three straight, like three times in five nights or something like that. And then they play them in the first game of the season in Toronto. You know when they play again? March. March ninth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah, five months. Yeah. before we see Toronto play Montreal again. This uh, and the season is too long. I think, for my personal opinion, it. You know, they're hoisting the Stanley Cup in the middle of the summer. It's too long. Yeah. It's just yeah, crazy. True. Yeah. Dick, uh, we had Mike Farber in here uh, just a couple of days ago, and we were having a conversation about the uh, the lack of a Stanley Cup in Canada over the last how many years, Ted? Well, 30. it would have been, yeah, 30, the yeah. Canadians there were the last go. 1993, yeah. the Canadians. There you go. And uh, just wondering what your theory is. is. Is there, can you point to anything, or is it just that's the way she goes? You know, the, uh, the last, when they won that cup, Jock Demers was the coach. I did the post-game interviews uh, in the dressing room after the last game, which I used to hate to do because how would you like to stand there and get champagne <laughs> yeah. thrown in your face and you're trying to – you can't see and you're trying to interview people. It's they true. didn't pass out the goggles uh, back then. Yeah. But if, I, if, you, if you'd have said to me, one of you chaps had have said to me that night, you know, oh, that job you just did. Nobody in Canada is going to do that job for at least the next 30 years. I would have said, wait a minute. First of all, we're talking about the Montreal Canadiens. And we're talking Canadian. What are you talking about? 30 years. Well, it's been 30 years since Canada. You know, I probably I, I drove my dad nuts with <laughs> questions about hockey. Uh, I, wish I, I wish now, with the interest that I have in life, I'd have asked him more about his service overseas in World War I. But as it turned out, of course, when your father's a coach of a six-team NHL, <laughs> wow, that's what you're going to talk about. But he, I used to. One of the questions I used to ask him was, "What makes a good hockey team? What's what's the, the key?" He always had the same answer: "It starts at the top." That's what he always used to say. And you got to figure, okay, it's management, pure and simple. And maybe that's what's been lacking. I mean, we've had our share of managers here in Toronto. There's like a revolving door. Uh, you know, the Calgary Flames have a new general manager this year. The Vancouver Canucks have. I mean, it's, I don't know. It, it's, it, but that, I always go by that. What my dad used to say, it starts at the top. So maybe that's where you have to look. If you're going to see what's been going on in Canadian-based NHL hockey for the last 30 years. And I also think some of the new managers spend too much time with things like analytics and uh, analyzing, you know, they, you know, as you were talking about before about the Rocket and Lafleur, a lot of the game is instinct. Oh, yeah. It's, it's uh, no, no question, Terry. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, and uh, well, look at baseball, the Blue Jays manager, what he did at the end of the year with the, with the analytic business. It's, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's really taken over, and uh, I, I'm not that close to it anymore. I don't talk to them. I don't know what their thinking is and things like this. Um, but I, I'm concerned, uh, you know, that I, maybe I shouldn't be concerned. I, hey, it's, it's a brand-new season for the Canadians. But uh, I just hope they, they get out of last place. That team two years ago. The worst year in the history of the Canadians was the year before my father came here to coach. They won 10 games out of in a 48-game season. They won three games of their last 35. And if you took the team from two years ago, not last year, but two years ago, the one that finished what became the first team in hockey history to finish 32nd because it was the first year there were 32 teams. Um, they, After 48 games, they had a poorer record than that team from 1939 and 40 did. So you have to say that's the worst they've ever been because after that you couldn't compare. Oh. You had to compare the 48 games, at least I thought. So it's really been a, a tough go. And the fan, I think the support has been good and the fans have been pretty good. But they boo the kid the other night. Can you tell me that? 
Well, Every time Bedard touched the puck, they booed him. Why? I've been told, Dick, and I don't buy it for a second, I've been told, well, it's a sign of respect. <laughs> well, that's like Bobby Orr. They booed him his whole career in Toronto. I remember. Every time he played in Toronto, they booed Bobby Orr. I remember, and uh, and I don't think it's a sign of respect. Neither I think, do I. I think it's just it's unsophisticated, vulgar behavior to me. It was strange. I couldn't figure that one out. You know, I thought the kid would be, I thought if he scored a goal, let's say that night, they'd have brought the house down, yeah. you know, just yeah. to see him get a goal. Yeah. Well, he but, said, he said he loved it. He said he thought uh, it was awesome. So to <laughs> me, all the more reason not to boo him because yeah. now you're fueling his confidence and enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Dick, yeah. when you yeah. were, when you were in the booth, I always wondered about this because, you know, when I watch a game, I remember I was telling this story the other night. When I moved to Calgary to become a broadcaster in Calgary, you know, they bought me a flame sweater and I went to a game and, you know, I thought I, I, I'm going to live in Calgary now. I got to become a Flames fan. And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. You know, if you're born and raised Montreal or I think you, you bleed Le Blanc Rouge, I just couldn't bring myself to cheer for the Flames. And I had, you know, I had to pretend if I went to a Flames game, especially if the Habs were playing. And I wondered in the broadcast booth, would, you know, did you ever, like, not that, that you were ever, you know, a cheering on either team that you were calling, but did your heart ever break quietly if the Canadians, like, lost, I, I, I guess they didn't really lose many games back then, but you know what I mean? Were, were you in the booth hoping for the best for the Habs? Well, <laughs> you know, that's a hazard of the trade. Yeah. Is the homerism. Uh, Ted Blackman, in, in back when I first started, when I first started, I like to tell a story broadcasting with Danny. There were six teams in the NHL. When I left broadcasting games, there were 26. So you had to do some homework along the way. That's why I marvel at the guys today, how they know who these guys are. And, but that's all, they get a lot of stats. Um, you know, the, the homerism is something that you, are accused of all the time. Ted Blackman used to be on the air in the morning and he used to call, like there was Danny and Dick in Montreal and there was Bill Hewitt and Brian McFarlane in Toronto. And that's the only games we got, you know? That was basically the television. He did many games from the States. And Ted used to call Brian, Brian McMaple Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> because, and, and, they, and there were guys on the radio talking about me and Danny in Toronto. Yeah. yeah. You know, they were upset with us because we were so pro for the Canadians. And when they play Toronto, we'd be against blah, blah, blah. That was, do you know, in those days, Hockey Night in Canada, Danny Gallivan never broadcast a game in Maple Leaf Gardens. Really? Because I didn't Montreal know. broadcasters, we never did a game at Maple Leaf Gardens. In the 1967 series where the Leafs won the cup and they beat the Canadians, we only did the Montreal games and the Toronto guys did the Toronto games. Oh, Wow. So uh, that's uh, that was. Uh, don't ask me why. I was brand new to the show. You know, I wasn't going to ask any questions because <laughs> yeah. I wanted I wanted the job. Uh, so I played it straight. Um, it, it's a hazard of the trade. I find, and, and I shouldn't say things like this, but having learned the living that I did, what I do it. I find the Blue Jay guys and the Raptors guys. I mean, they might as well wear the team uniforms. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. In, in, yeah. In the broadcast yeah. booth, um, I don't find hockey guys uh, American. There's the there used to be a, a couple of guys in Philadelphia. Oh, even the broadcasters, we'd have our annual broadcasters meeting at the at the meetings, the NHL meetings, and we would go after these two guys about how biased you guys are. And uh, but I don't think in Canada, I, I don't know. I tried. I, I have to admit, now, I did radio, right? I yeah. did CFCF radio for 29 years. And you do a radio game a little different than a TV game. Radio game is more folksy. You're talking just to your radio audience. It's a home game, a home team. So you, you loosen up a bit, you know? Uh, I'm not a fan of first name, nickname broadcasting. I heard the, uh, they, they carried a game, maybe it was last year, I'm not sure last year, this year, the Tampa Bay Lightning. And everything's a first name. The coach is not John Cooper, it's Coop. Mm. And uh, this player is this nickname. And this player, mm. like, we're, we're their buddies, you know? Well, Coop told me this morning, no, I, yeah. on a national broadcast, I, I don't go for that. that. But that's just me. That's just a personal opinion. So I did the best I could. And yeah, well, I think Danny did the best he could. Yeah. And 
uh, you know, I don't know if you sometimes they repeat they repeat some games on, on TV. One of the games they repeat often is the game final game in 1976 when the Canadians won the first of Scotty's four in a row after the Flyers had won the previous two years. And the game was in Philadelphia. And it was a Sunday afternoon game. I remember who got the winning goal, a guy called the Fleur. Um, <laughs> and if you listen to that game, I don't know if you'd say that Gallivan and Urban were, were biased, were homers, were cheering for the Canadians to win four straight. Which I don't know. I, I, I like to think that I played it as straight down the middle as I could. Hey, I think so. I yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I think so. I just, I just wondered if in the booth, you know, quietly without saying anything, when they, when they raised the cup, you were happy as a Canadians guy. Oh, you have yeah. to be. Hey, yeah. listen, Terry, I traveled with the team for six months. Yeah, I was yeah. on charter flight. Yeah. I was with the players. I was. You'd sit beside some of the guys at breakfast in the hotel. Yeah. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be attracted to that situation. Yeah. But I, I, I'll, all I can say about the, and people have asked me about it, and not so much now, but in the old days, and I just say I did the best I could. Speaking of, I, I don't know if this is true, Dick, but were you not the originator of the Canadians are skating left to right on your radio? That was yeah. such a beautiful description, and it was such such a genius use of the medium, you know, the the theater of the mind. And I'm pretty sure you started that because I've heard other people use it, but that was yours, wasn't it? Well, it's supposed to be, but I stole it. <laughs> oh, you stole oh, yeah. it? I didn't know that. You're coming clean. <laughs> there, but there was a fellow named Bob Prince who used to broadcast the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates baseball right. games, but he wow. also broadcast Pittsburgh Steelers games on the radio. Wow. And I caught him on the radio one time in my car, doing a Pittsburgh Steelers game, and he said, Steelers are moving from left to right on your radio. Wow. Now. And that's where I stole it from. I, I, I will admit that. And, and, uh, but, but I think I was the first guy. I heard somebody say it the other night on television. Because uh, I, I haven't, you know, uh, I, and I don't think it, was, it wasn't a Canadians game. It was an exhibition game, I think it was. And one of the announcers, whoever, that's another thing people complain to me. They say, we don't know who the announcers are. There's two guys do t tonight's game from the, for the Canadians. Two guys do Wednesday night's game. Yeah. Seems like the other two do Saturday's game. Yeah. It depends what network they're on. It's Sportsnet, it's Hockey Night, it's TSN or whatever. You know. In our case, we did all the games. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dick, and then I did, I did the games on radio that weren't on television, and uh, that's another story. Dick, tell us about the experience, and I assume the privilege of working uh, cheek by jowl for all those decades with the late, great, and ever so loquacious Danny Gallivan. Well, you know, Ted, people have asked me many times since I retired what uh, were the best thrills I had uh, broadcasting the hockey games. And there were two um, in my broadcasting career. One was being the English language MC, along with Richard Garneau, the late Richard Garneau, who did the French, uh, of the closing of the forum, uh, the ceremony they had at the uh, the closing of the forum. I don't think there's ever been a ceremony like it in anywhere in hockey, and that was the night they gave the Rocket his uh, nine-minute standing ovation and so on. And the other top thing for me in my memory bank is 17 years in the booth beside Danny Gallivan. I mean, there are young announcers, including yourself probably, <laughs> who would have given whatever to do 17 games with Danny Gallivan. I did 17 years. And it was, we fitted in right, we didn't, we, we never had a meeting. Danny wouldn't show up at meetings anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> I, know some I, I know some broadcasters who, oh, I can't uh, do an interview at 2 o'clock. That's when we sit down, me and my partner, and we go through the lineups and we talk about the broadcast. <laughs> Danny, we... <laughs> We never, he'd show up, he hated the pregame meetings, he'd be, be at a few of them, but not all of them, and the first time we'd see each other from one Saturday night to the other was when in the broadcast booth, because remember I was the host of the show, right. I did seven years, I called it the upstairs downstairs <laughs> part of my career, and I used to have to leave the game with two minutes to go in each period to go downstairs to do the intermission, and I'd miss the first two minutes of the period when I came upstairs because there was no elevator on that side of the forum in those days. I used to have to climb the stairs. Thank God it's not now. Um, <laughs> I've got a stair lift at my house. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so we we never we didn't socialize. We both played a lot of golf. He was a member at Kanawaki. I'm a member at Beaconsfield. We played maybe two, three games a, uh, together in our whole life. I mean, we both loved golf and talked a lot about golf. We played in California. He went out there and we did a couple of games there. Uh, and uh, and Danny and I played golf there. But it was it was strictly business. Even after he retired, we didn't uh, get together too much. But it was just that I was there with Danny Gallivan. And uh, I was the first person that he told that he was quitting, that he was retiring. And uh, we'd done a series in, uh, it was the first year that the uh, uh, that the Oilers won the Stanley Cup. They were waiting for the winner of, of a Montreal Islanders series. The sixth game was in Long Island. Islanders won. Canadians gave it a good shot, almost forced a game seven. We came home with the team. We walked together to the parking lot. We'd been sitting together on the plane, and he, and he hadn't said a word. So I said to him, we were going to do the, we were booked to do the finals. And I said to Daddy as we left, I said, well, I'll see you in Edmonton. I was going to go out early to the West. And um, I said, I'll see you in Edmonton. He said, no, you won't. I'm not doing the games. He says, I'm retiring. I said, what? Yeah, he said, I'm not going to be there. And, you know, he had a cold. He was a little out of sorts. I thought, oh, he's not feeling. He's tired. He'll be there. So anyway, I get to Edmonton, and I walk into the broadcast uh, situation, and there's Bob Cole. Oh. And Danny never did another game. But uh, And when I started uh, way back 17 years before, he treated me like, I mean, it was just like we'd been sitting there all for years. It was There was no fuss, no muss. Uh, he just accepted me as I took the place of a fellow named Keith Dancy, who had been doing the games before when they first started doing television. And uh, so uh, it was a very easy relationship, uh, strictly base, basically strictly business, but with a lot of fun, a lot of fun. There's never been anyone like him, and no. I don't that I know no. of. There aren't even any imitators because no. you couldn't. You can't. You couldn't. No, you can't. Yeah. yeah what a unique, special yeah. talent he was. Do you know? Do you know why he decided to walk away, Dick? Was he just fed up? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it was, I don't know, it was it was a shock to me. And uh, how about the night? I mean, we, I mean, there's a lot of Danny Gallivan stories. We're doing a game. It was a playoff game uh, one year between the Canadians and the Islanders. And we used to do it in the, there was no booth for us in those the, the television. We did it in the crowd. Did a lot of games in the crowd. It was funny. And we did the first period. And uh, I'd done the pregame interviews, and I did the first intermission interview with somebody. And then he, after the first period, he sat back and he lit up his cigarette with the cigarette holder, and he was very relaxed. And so now the second period starts, and his first words were, Well, Dick, he said, uh, I think the viewers are a little tired of listening to this raspy voice of mine, so I'm just going to take a, a break here, and you can take over. <laughs> <laughs> with that he takes with that he takes off his micro his head fit, puts it down, lights up his cigarette again and sits back, and I'm all by myself. <laughs> there wasn't we didn't have a third man in the booth at that sometimes a lot of times we did, of course, but that particular night there was just the two of us. <laughs> so I had to do it. And they canceled the second inversion interviews and the post game. And I'm thinking, what if this thing goes into three overtime periods? <laughs> it was a playoff game. Anyway, it ended in regulation time, so I got lucky. Yeah, uh, things like that. Yeah, that was Danny. I mean, uh, one other time I came up, I was late getting back from my intermission duties. Red Story was working with us that night. And when I get to the broadcast booth, you can never hear Rene Le Cavalier talking, but you could hear Danny because he was... And he and Red are talking, Red's telling a story. And they both are looking at each other like this, and they're not watching the game. <laughs> and the Canadians score. Yvonne Lambert scored. <laughs> and the crowd is big, you know, the forum, everybody's cheering. And I just arrived into the booth. I hadn't seen the goal either, because I was what? Danny sits back, he turns to me, and he says, Well, Dick, what did you think of that goal? <laughs> <laughs> And he he knew that I hadn't seen it. And he hadn't seen it. Here's three guys in the booth, and none of us have seen the goal score. But the, the, the funniest Danny Gallivan, Danny had a hand mic, right? For you know, for yep. years. He had, yep. he had the mic and he had it in, and that's what he did. Now the CBC goes high tech. It was that same night that Guy Lafleur 
had the transformation that, that he suddenly became a different guy. So that would be the, what, around 74, 74, 75 season. And all through the summer, we'd had a, we'd, we'd hear that the CBC was going to go high tech and we were going to wear the headset. No more hand mic. Danny fought it like crazy. And he didn't want that to happen. There were some pretty rough meetings, I'm telling you. He did not want to change. So finally he said, let me hold something in my hand. Okay, that's fine. But so now we start the first game, Canadians Islanders. They didn't, we didn't do exhibition games in those days. I never did an exhibition game on television. This year they did them all, <laughs> English and French. Yeah. We never did. The, the team used to play minor <clears throat> league teams, the Montreal Royals, the Quebec Aces, major squad games in small towns. That's what they did. They never played NHL. Anyway, so we're doing our first NHL game of the year. And Danny's, we're doing the game. So at one point, Danny's got, he's got a, uh, he used to use, what do you have to use? I think he used a pencil, really, something like that. He, uh, just, uh, he had a piece of pipe. No, he had, he had the old, at home games, he had the old fashioned microphone, not hooked up to anything, just a piece of pipe. That's what it was. And he's talking away and he's doing the game like this and this and this. And at one point, Second period, Danny, now you think about this. Danny goes. Uh, <laughs> 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 now that's what, oh that's what he had been doing for around 15 years. And he didn't realize, well, that's the only time, gentlemen, in my 33 years of broadcasting hockey games that I had to take off my headset <laughs> And walk away <laughs> because I was laughing so much I could not have said anything at that point. I just got the hell out of there. That's hey, what I did. Broadcasters are going to love that and story. And he looked yeah. at me like, "What's wrong?" <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> and away, and he kept going. <laughs> hey, Dick, do you still have a powder blue jacket, a hockey night in Canada jacket somewhere? Are you? Did you ever keep any of that paraphernalia? It's there. It really? Hey, you still have one. I guess hanging in the little closet. Love it. Right upstairs uh, in the next floor. Absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, but it doesn't fit me anymore. <laughs> uh, not, not bad. Not bad. It, it's close. I had a story I was thinking about telling you guys about the uh, the, the blue jacket. Oh, yeah. In, the, in L.A., in Los Angeles, Jack Kent Cook made a fortune out of broadcasting and media, and yet he built an arena in L.A. that didn't have a press box. Huh. So we have to, used to have to sit in the crowd. Like tonight, it's, it's, there's a game on there. The Kings are playing tonight. And there's all the media and the whole big section, broadcasters, writers, whatever. Tomorrow night, there's a rock concert or a boxing show. And the, the, those seats are sold with tickets. And one night, we're in L.A. And I'm wearing the blue jacket because we were on television. And a guy came up to me with his ticket stub. He wanted to know where his seat was because he <laughs> thought I was an usher. <laughs> And I, that's not, I wasn't the only one. A couple of the other guys had the same thing happen to me. Yeah. That was, uh, but, you know, I was upset when the CBC changed that. I yeah. mean, that was, ho that was hockey night in Canada. Well, it was very Canadian. And, uh, yes. Yes, exactly. And uh, I can remember some of the announcer guys were, you know, it's okay, so we had our egos with being on the big show in the big sky. And one of the guys said, you know, we're wearing this. Then they put us back in a regular CBC jacket. And one of the guys said, uh, you know, we're wearing the same jacket as the guys that do archery. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little different than Hockey Night in Canada. I got the, where's the picture? It's a good one. Right there. With Scotty. And, uh, but uh, so anyway, we ended up uh, wearing uh, just, uh, so I don't know how many years we wore that, but here's a picture. Can I show this? Yeah, you can. This, Absolutely. This is with the CBC jackets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The dark, they were, were they, were yeah. they, were they yeah. dark the blue, thing. Dick? Yeah. Yeah. And Scotty on the left, uh, uh, for a couple of years, he worked for Hockey Night in Canada yeah. when he couldn't get a job coaching. It shows you how smart the hockey executives yeah, were. Sure, yeah. Scotty Bowman couldn't get a job. Jesus Chris Cuthbert with hair <laughs> sitting in the front. Yeah. And, the, and the fellow in the middle at the back um, is our producer, Ed Milliken. Oh. But that's the jackets we were wearing after they got rid of the, uh, the blue jackets. They were uh, to me. They were the blue jackets. The powder blue jackets were iconic. Canadiana. Yeah, Canadiana. Yeah, that's exactly right. 
do you do you still go turn to the TV on a Saturday night, Dick, and think oh, I'm going to watch a period or two? Oh yes, you do, oh, sure. eh? Yeah, it's a hockey game, Terry. You know, yeah. it's uh, you look for a good game. That's all. I, I I I have to admit that my interest right now is, and for the last couple of years, isn't what it was. But you know what my problem is, and I think it's a problem considering my life and my background. Uh, I don't know who the players are. Well, you, you, you and me there's, both. There's, yeah, there's there's just too many. They'll talk about a fellow who's playing in his 433rd NHL game or something. I've never heard of. Him. Yeah. yeah, and that's my fault. I mean, uh, I'm sure you, you could interview lots of fans that could talk about players, and I read these blogs and so on, and 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 I give everybody credit that that keeps up to date with this stuff. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, and and there's 32 teams. My 24-year-old son knows them all, Dick. If there's Does anything you really, need Ted? to know, let you me see? know, and I'll really, ask eh? him. Yeah, oh, yeah. Each Sam and every knows one the, of them. Well, eh? I don't know about each and every yeah. one, but uh, but pretty much most of them. More than I do, that's for sure. Way you, more. You think more. about a third-line player in Florida, I, I wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have a clue. No. Yeah. 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 The, the, the Canadians have this fellow, I've got a gun blank on his name, played for Colorado two years ago. He was on their Stanley Cup winning team. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's yeah, Newhook, Alex Newhook. Newhook. Yeah, yeah. And, Nancy, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I had never heard of Alec Newhook until he joined the Montreal Canadiens. Me in too. A, a training camp, and with no offense to him, but it's just when you're, you know, I, I have to call myself a casual fan now. I okay. Suppose. Uh, you know, sure, I was interested in the kid Bedard. Hey, he played for the Regina Pats, my old yep. hometown. Yeah. That's, uh, he has to be good. I played for the Regina Pat Juveniles. I didn't play for the juniors. I didn't even ask to get try out for the juniors. <laughs> but, it, but they're still in business. The oldest existing junior hockey team in Canada. Wow. And they haven't, you know, and uh, that's where he played. But he's from Vancouver. Yeah, that's where he comes from. His uh, last minister, I think it is. <laughs> and uh, so I wish him luck. He's having. Uh, he might have some trouble, but he'll get there. He'll he'll be fine. Look what happened to Lafleur. I mean, his first three years yeah. was not very. Impressive, and nobody paid all that much attention to him by the time he was in year three. Lot, <laughs> we sure did. We sure did in year four. A lot of uh, hockey history in Saskatchewan, eh, Dick? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of NHL history in Saskatchewan. Well, it's. Uh, uh, I always tell people if I ever go out and make a speech in Regina that the Chicago Blackhawks started in Regina, and they became they were the Regina Cat. That's how my dad. He was a big amateur hockey player in Winnipeg, and the guy who owned the they were in the uh, a league that was on a par with the NHL, the uh, old Western Canada League, and they he went to Regina, and that's where he he's liked Regina so much he settled there. He'd grown up in Winnipeg and served overseas in the Winnipeg Fort Garry Horse Regiment, so he was a Winnipegger. But then when he went to Regina, he stayed there, and then they, that team was sold to Portland, Oregon, the Portland Rosebuds. How's that a name for you? <laughs> and uh, they've lasted, and then that league folded. The whole league folded. They, the two winners used to play off. The Western League and the NHL would play off for the Stanley Cup back around the time of World War One, and that's when the uh, the flu canceled the Stanley the, the Stanley Cup final when the Canadians were in Seattle and the Canadians lost. Uh, Joe Hall, a wonderful player, he was, I guess, died of the flu, and they canceled the rest of the Stanley. Cup final, and uh, that was the last time the cup wasn't won until they had the lockout here. Uh, here, so uh, and then the, so a guy and the, the players were dispersed to various NHL teams, except a guy in Chicago called Major McLaughlin uh, bought the entire Portland team and moved it to Chicago, which didn't have a hockey team. Hmm. So my dad was the first captain of the Chicago Blackhawks because he was the captain of the Portland Rosebuds. Wow. And, uh, now, here's one for you. So if there's a question that somebody asked me, I've been asked more than once. Has there ever been an NHL hockey team named after a nightclub? <laughs> That's a good question. And the answer is yes. Who would the that Chicago be? Chicago Blackhawks. Because that the guy that bought the team, he made his fortune in the coffee business. He had been a major in the Blackhawk Regiment in World War I, American Army. When he went back to Chicago, he made his fortune and he opened up a nightclub and he called it the Blackhawk. And it was the club. That was where the big bands played, the big singers sang. You know, it was the place in Chicago, the Black Hawk Restaurant or whatever, or nightclub, whatever they called it. So when he got a hockey team, he wanted to get some publicity for his restaurant. So he called them the Black Hawks. I didn't know that. 
that's, a, that's how it happened. Well, that that's the kind of history that you would learn um, uh, if you read. How many books have you? How many books have you written, Dick? Six. There you go. Hockey. Six. Ho- hockey. Really, yeah, really the, the, the country's hockey historian. What have you got there, Ted? Before we go, yes. uh, I got a couple of pictures that Nancy, Dick's daughter, sent to us. Yes. She found one of uh, you uh, at a hockey game in 2016. You yes. ran into Dick, got a yeah. picture, and one where Dick and I ran into each other outside the IGA in Point Claire in 2019. Nancy sent them along, <laughs> so I thought maybe we'd... We'd put them up just for the sake of posterity. What do yeah, you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Will Dick be able to see them from where he is? Uh, no. No? Oh, okay. cripes, Dick. Sorry, you're not going to be able. I'm sure you've seen them already. <laughs> but... Nancy is sitting beside oh, me. Okay. We have to thank her. She's yes. the producer of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This and end. she's done it. And, and she oh, now, now she's showing me the picture, Tony, okay. of you and me. Yeah. And, and my, uh, my grandson, Doug. Uh, yes. Grandson, uh, Ben. Yeah. He was a big guy. Uh, that was a Pittsburgh game because Ben was a big Sidney Crosby fan. Is oh, that yeah. right? And I would take him to the any time I could. I that I could take him when Pittsburgh came here. Yeah. You, you, <clears throat> and then I, here's you and me, Terry. Yeah. Uh, dead uh, outside the the store. Yeah, outside the IG. You want me to bring it up? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I. It, my, you, you, you've got a bag. You've done your shopping, so you're poor. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm about to go in to do my shopping, so I'm about to be. There poor. you go. Yeah. D- Dick, you said you take your. Oh, there we are. There yeah. you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dick, ah. Dick, you said you you take your grand you took your grandson to see the Penguins when you could. Don't tell me you had a hard time getting hockey tickets. Oh no, no <laughs> okay. but he maybe couldn't make it for oh, okay. school or whatever. Gotcha. You know? Okay, <laughs> Dick, we've been uh, we've been chatting for an hour, and we promised Nancy. I I can't thank Nancy enough because I contacted Nancy as you probably know about a month ago, and and she said, "Well, I don't know if my dad's going to want to do that, but let me look into it," and she. She's sort of guided and heralded this, and as you point out, has produced it on your end. Please give her, uh, please tell her thank you so much. She's uh, been a terrific help and and absolutely lovely to deal with. Well, I had to do what she asked me to do, uh, Terry, or else I wouldn't be getting once in a while my meals on wheels from next door. You know, to, to, to get to give my microwave a night off. <laughs> That's a great blessing, though, eh, Dick? To have family right around the corner and stay in the same neighborhood all these years. It's wonderful. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Yeah. Very, very lucky. And, you know, my wife passed away uh, 20 years ago. Wow. And I've been living in the, this uh, big four-bedroom, four-bathroom house all by myself for 20 years. Like, wow. I need, like, a hole in the head, you know? <laughs> and uh, But with the, my next-door neighbors are pretty good people. They're, they're pretty good. Nice. Uh, nice to hear. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I just I just wanted to say thanks because we really appreciate the time, and the stories are legendary. And as you know, you know people of our age, um, I just can't believe we've had the privilege of being able to talk to you because you're a national treasure. And uh, when I was a kid, I I don't if I'd bumped into you, I don't think I would have been able to talk. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so so much. Well, thanks, guys. It's a, as I said at the beginning, when you're with old friends, it makes it so much better. Thank you, Dick. Okay, guys. See Thanks, you later. Dick. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. Bye. Well, there's the um, the legendary Dick Irvin. That was pretty good. And it was, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a powerful uh, it's a powerful. Uh, it's just yeah, I don't know what to say. Well, we grew up watching him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's when exactly we watched right. when we were kids, yeah. he talked about that 1971. Stanley Cup I, run. I with remember the that. I remember hand. it. I too. remember it so well. Yes. And Danny and Dick were doing the uh, were doing the games. And your description of Danny Gallon was Danny Gallon. Danny Gallivan was beautiful, loquacious, unlike he was me. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Danny Gallivan sure is good, eh? Yeah. Yeah. He talks good. Yeah, he talk, <laughs> he's a good talker. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of a guy who used to work with. He once said to me. You know, when I listen to you on the radio, it's you're uh, like with words, you do, you're able to. And I said, articulate. And he goes, yeah. yeah that's it. <laughs> and listen, I um, I'm, if you you download the podcast, this is a bonus episode, and I'm sure our sponsors will be fine with it. Dick Irvin is 91, and there are two things um, that immediately struck me. Number one is how sharp he is. Yep. And number two, the voice has it's not diminished. It's still there. That is the one of the most identifiable voices in all of the country. Yeah. 
and it was still there and still strong. But Nancy said, you know, about an hour, you know, because... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you and I have had this conversation this week. We're a generation younger than Dick. Yeah. And, you know, after uh, two of these in one day, I'm like, can we go home now? (laughs) (laughs) So what what I did was I structured this on the fly a little differently. We have four sponsors we have to thank, and I'm sure they'll be fine with it. Um, Our new sponsors, Accutech Electric, our old friends, the Mersons, our old friends at Matla Bonheur, and our good friends at Jaguar Land Rover Laval. We'll keep it short um, because it's a bonus episode. Um, but we we can start by thanking Nino and Renato for last night's gift of the game, speaking of hockey, at yep. Place Bell. They had us in the loge at Place Bell to see the Laval Rocket and the Rochester Americans. And uh, what a great time we had. And all three generations of the family were there. Well, there are four generations of the family, but the great-grandkids gar- weren't there. Nino and Renato were there. Nino's sons, uh, Vilio and Sergio, were there. And Nino and Renato's dad, Vilio, was there as well. Mr. And, Bellis. Yeah, they make us feel like family. They, do. they really do. You're going to make they me really cry. Do. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, if, take over. If you- <laughs> If you're looking for a luxury vehicle, yeah, go see that family. They'll treat you like family. And uh, the brands that they ca- carry, Jaguar and Land Rover. They're pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ted has been squiring me around in the new Evoque. And, uh, Land Rover Evoque, yeah. Yeah. I uh, have a hard time staying awake. That thing's so comfortable and, and beautiful to Jag- drive. JaguarLaval.ca and LandRoverLaval.ca. Our friends at Matla Bonheur, speaking of uh, having a lie down, this is the place where I've been telling you to get a mattress for many, many years. Not just a mattress, but you can also get anything that has anything to do with a good night's sleep. Ted can now say that he knows exactly what I'm talking about because it took him to the very first store... They have 17 stores now, but the first one was on on uh, Boulevard Gouin in Saint Genevieve, and um, I took Ted there the other day, and he got tucked in by Kevin, the manager of the store. Literally, because yep. I wanted a new duvet, yep. and yep. Kevin said, "Well, lie down on that bed, and I'm going to put this duvet on you." But first, he asked me questions about my sleeping. Yes, and I told him I need something light because yep. I'm a schwitzer when I sleep. <laughs> that means sweating, by the way, yep. okay. <laughs> unless you think it means anything else. Yeah, okay. And he found a perfect duvet for me. I got the duvet, the duvet cover, and uh, nighty night. Nighty night. <laughs> There's a promo code right now. Uh, I think it's uh, Terry or Ted or something. I think it's Terry and Ted. Terry and Ted. And uh, what you do is uh, you go to uh, the website, matlabonner.ca, or you drop into a store and tell us, tell them you've been listening to uh, the Knuckleheads and you would like the discount from standing by. And uh, certainly not uh, last and least are our friends. Uh, we've got new friends, actually. Accutech Electric. I had a call from uh, Trish and Tom. I had a Zoom meeting with them. Ted was busy that day. Um, And I had a chat with uh, Tom and uh, uh, found out that he's a second-generation master electrician, that Accutech Electric is a family business, and that his father ran the business. He's now running it with all the philosophies his dad had about treating employees well, making sure customers are well looked after, and it's a, um, a place with a wide reach. They do residential. They do industrial. They can help you with high-end residential renovations. They can help you change your lighting in your company. They can steer you towards hydro rebates. And, of course, safety is their biggest concern. Um, they make sure they do things right. And if you're looking for a company to take care of your company or uh, electric needs at home, I highly suggest Accutech Electric. The more I found out about them, the more I loved them, and I said I would be happy to have you as a sponsor on the podcast and tell people about your company. Just love their ideals and the way they approach business. Accutech Electric, it's Accutech, A-C-U-T-E-C-H dot C-A. That's a good story, Granddad, and it's the second time in this segment that you've mentioned Accutech, so now we should talk about Mercer Automotive. Because you mentioned them right out of the gate, right off the top. But what? you didn't go into detail. What? There. You said right off the top, you said our new sponsors at Accutech, and then you segued 
into um, are you uh, telling me i did a commercial twice no 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 no. you just mentioned them off the top and then you segued into jaguar land rover laval okay because he gave me a heart attack that, there no, no, no. i was about to call the doctor that, no no you're fine i thought, yeah. I thought maybe i did yeah. <laughs> no no you didn't or, do full two full commercials but you had mentioned oh, them right yes. off the top okay. so i just want to make sure the mercens don't get left out <laughs> all right because we've only been doing business with them for about what 25 or 30 years yeah. now Merson Automotive on St. Jacques, west of Cavendish, and online at mercenauto.com. We're into the busy winter tire season. That's who you want to go see. They'll change your tires. They'll store your summer tires. If you need new tires, they'll tell you, and they'll outfit you, and you can get a rebate on Yokohama's. If you don't need new tires, they'll tell you that, and that's what we like about the Mercens. You go in there, they'll look at your tires and go, you're good for two more seasons, as opposed to going in there and they look at your tires like some guys wouldn't go, oh, boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, no, no, you're in trouble now, whether you are or not, because they want to sell you new tires. That's not how the Mersons work. They're honest folks, and that's why generations of customers keep on coming back to Merson Automotive. And I'll tell you about Accutech Electric. Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you broke the tension because I'm looking over at him and I'm going, he's fucking mad No, no, now. no, I'm not, I'm not mad, I'm scared. You know, I'm 65 now and I thought, ah, oh, shit, I hope I'm not getting dementia. No, you had just mentioned them yeah, yeah. No, off I, the top I, and I thought you were just going to no, do no, like a one yeah. sentence blurb for no, each sponsor. No, I, I, I thought... You were saying that I had done a commercial. No, not and, a full commercial. And, and completely <laughs> forgot about it. I thought, oh shit, someone call an ambulance. <laughs> Oh, anyway, good. oh, I'm glad you're okay because I got yeah, yeah. I was getting the old. Oh, yeah, really? Eh? I did, did I? No, no, and no. Thanks a lot. Ah, <laughs> uh, geez, Louise. Well, um, thank you, uh, Poseidon. My pleasure. Uh, Poseidon is our producer. Yeah. And a big thank you to Nancy Irvin. Nancy is Dick's daughter. And and Dick Irvin, it's, you know, it's actually Dick Irvin Jr. I know. You know, it's and, funny. And I, I never think to, about him that way. We couldn't go down that road because yeah. there wasn't time. But when he talked about uh, wanting to, you know, I wish I had asked my dad more about his service in yeah. World War One. Yeah. You know, I'll yeah. bet there's an interesting story yeah, there. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. I guess that's it. Eh? I think we're okay. done. Yeah, All yeah right. I need to lie down. That's the end of the bonus episode <laughs> brought to you by AccuTech. <laughs> I hope Tom and Boy, Trish they are got okay their with... money's worth. Yeah, they of sure... course, they'll be okay yeah, with they that. They sure did. Thank you. Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast has been brought to you by the UPS Store Canada. The UPS Store near you is locally owned and operated by a member of your small business community. 